Dear Mr. Bell, we have films of an extraterrestrial and its craft taken with a video and 35mm camera as well. The films and the story that go with them are like no other anyone has seen or heard to date. Dr. Jonathan Reed desires to make this information known exclusively on your program first. If you are interested, want to take a ride? Fire away, Doctor. What happened to you? And when? Okay. Well, this, this all took place uh, in October of 1996. And it was about 60 miles uh, east of Seattle and about 15 miles northeast of Snoqualmie Pass in the state of Washington. Okay, that pins it down. Okay, I had taken my dog on a day hike, which we had done often. Gone out where I could let her run. Sure. Uh, I had parked my car and been walking for about an hour and a half to two hours. So you're quite a ways in. Yes. This, this is definitely a heavily forested area, dense foliage, not, not a public park. And, uh, of course, when, when wildlife appears, a dog will take off and go running. And uh, Susie, you know, being still young, she was about seven years old, all of a sudden she took off. And I heard her barking up ahead on the trail. And the barking changed its tone. It got very, very serious. It was almost as if the dog was being treed instead of the dog treeing something else. Yeah, you can tell the difference between a dog aggressively going after something, which is certainly an aggressive bark, and a dog in distress. That's Absolutely. A big difference. At that point, I grabbed the stick, I ran up the hill, and as I crested the hill, I saw my dog involved with this creature. At that point, I didn't know what it was. All I could tell was the dog had the creature by the arm, and it was nothing I had ever witnessed before. Can you, can you, from memory, describe at that point from the top of the hill what it appeared to you to be or what your first impression was? My first impression was that it, it was probably a child because it was childlike in size. Okay. It had two arms, two legs, and a head, and I was approximately 25 feet away from it at that point. Even though it was standing in a fixed position, it was vibrating somewhat like a can of paint and a paint shaker. No, I've seen them. It almost created a blur, except I could see the dog was clamped on to its floor. Was the dog also moving in that manner, or did it not appear that way? It appeared that the head of Susie, the head of my dog, was, was also shaking violently. Uh -huh. But the rest of her was pretty much in one place, trying to get footing. Gotcha. I yelled as loud as I could, Susie, let go. And at that moment, I started to witness the dog's actual physical body starting to deteriorate, starting to almost implode. The skin and, and snout of her head peeling back against the back of her neck. And this was all happening in just seconds. And at, in between second to second, I would see this thing stop and look at me, staring at me, and then turn back and again back to, to Susie. So well, at that point, I ran forward with my bat, my wooden bat, and jumped straight in front of it and clubbed it. And I hit the left side of the creature's head hard enough to slam it backwards and to one side about four feet. Mm -hmm. I had killed it. And at the same time this was happening, my dog was literally imploding into nothing.
got something kind of interesting here. Somebody sent it to me, and I thought it was kind of unique. Uh, as you know, the Roswell crash occurred uh, in July of uh, 1947, and there were newspaper headlines that I'm sure many of you have seen, but there was also a radio report of the Roswell crash, if you can imagine that. Uh, it's very short, and I'm going to have to just lean into my computer speaker and, uh, and hit play and see if you're going to be able to hear this. In fact, let me just take my headphones off and do that. Here we go. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Fascinating, huh? Can you imagine how that headline, brief as it was, was greeted by the world? Thought you might be interested uh, in hearing that. I am the madman in the desert who camps for days at a time at the Mojave Desert phone booth. This is a phone booth out in the middle of nowhere, I guess. I've wanted to chat with you for a few years now, but I have always suspected the government monitors all your calls. Well, sure they do. But now I just don't care anymore. His name is Desert Chad. Chad, hello. Good evening, Art. Are you real? Yes, I am. Where in the hell is this phone booth? This phone booth is sitting on a plateau 4,200 feet up in the middle of a Joshua Tree forest on an old mining road off of I-15, as say you're going from Baker, California into Vegas. Right. I would suggest four-wheel drive, even though I don't have a four-wheel drive. Why car. would anybody put a phone booth in a place where you'd need a four-wheel drive vehicle to get to it? Well, I'll tell you, Art. There used to be a mine up there in the 60s, and the phone company put that phone in there so the miners would be able to call home to their families. Oh! And I believe it was 1968 that the mine closed, and the phone company never bothered to went up there and take the phone out. It's 15 miles from the nearest paved road. All the glass is shot out of it. It's in a billion shards all around it. There's yeah. holes in the frame. The door's ripped off. I'll be out there camping, Art, and I had to take the phone off the hook at night to sleep, because I can't sleep. You're kidding. I know, and I feel guilty about that. It rings that much. It rings that much. I met a local rancher, because I camp out there regularly, and he was telling me that it was the oddest thing. This phone company came up there in 1977 and put a push button in and then left. And he laughed because <laughs> there's no traffic on this road. <laughs> right. It's 15 and miles so they, from they the actually, they, they actually upgraded the phone. Yes. I talk to uh, Switzerland. I talk to Australia. Most of my days when I'm in the desert, I'm standing in that booth. You know, people just want to connect. And that is just an extremely unique way to do it. I mean, we have the Internet, and you can sit in your house, and you can talk to the world. There is just something so unique about standing in the middle of nowhere on a plateau talking to Australia, Africa. Of course, I talk to Kansas, uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And nobody's ripped it out or destroyed it? No, and Art, it rings 24 hours a day, seven days a week, from around the world. First time caller line, you're on the air with Linda Howe. Hi, where are you calling from, please? Illinois. Okay. We found something very bizarre we can't get an answer to, and hopefully one of you do. Um, it was a folded metal container, Army Green. On it is printed Ward Container, U.S. Army, M-U-S-T Project, Office of the Surgeon General. This thing is huge, and it was buried in the grass near a forest preserve, and we're wondering what in the world is this. Oh, my God. What does the Surgeon General have to do with the U.S. Army, and what are these containers for? Well, uh, that is a good question, and I might be able to find some answers. Could you give me the approximate size? They're about eight feet high. If you stand it up the way the printing reads, it would be about eight feet one direction, about four feet the other. But they're folded, and they're laying in the grass. They're not arrested yet. How many of them are there? Um, they're at almost all of the entrances to the forest preserve. 
Forest Preserve. So do you feel like there's a possibility they may have something to do with the structure of a gate or something that has to that's, that's one of the possibilities because I suppose if you put them end to end instead of making a box out of them, they could be a gate. But nearby where this place is, there was a crash of one of those mysterious little black helicopters and passers-by came upon this thing. The army was all over the place, but the pilot, they got there first, and the pilot was thrown from it. He was Asian. He had on a black jumpsuit with a white triangle in the upper left-hand corner. A white triangle? A white triangle. He spoke no English, but he had U.N. papers, and they, they got the papers. <laughs> it's been a real to-do out here. Well, you well, know what I think? I think uh, we better give you Linda Howe's uh, number. And yes. Okay. I got a whole bunch I was of stuff you. I'd like to all right, ma'am, 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 ma'am. Uh, okay. okay. Go ahead and call Linda in the morning, would you please? I will do that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Wow, Linda. If this is something that checks out, it is another indication of stories that stay bottled up in a local area. This was Illinois. I certainly have not heard about this. Dr. Jonathan Reed. So now we've got dog imploded. We've got alien um, on the ground and apparently dead. I was an emotional wreck. I got up, tried to walk, and couldn't, and fell back down to my knees and was so emotionally distraught that I was moaning and sobbing at what had happened, especially my dog and at this point I walked back to where the creature was there were no signs of movement from the creature at all at there were no signs of movement at all okay and I had realized that I had killed it mm -hmm. I, I started thinking well nobody's gonna believe this nobody's gonna see this but I remembered that I had my cameras with me I had a video camera with me, and I had a 35 millimeter camera with me. So you had the presence of mind to get your cameras out, and what did you take photographs of? I started taking photographs of everything. Where Susie had fallen, uh, where the creature had, had died, the body, the head, the, the entire scene. You packed up, you, you had to... Uh, sort of what, a heat, what do, you, what, what do you call that, a thermal blanket? I had a thermal blanket in my pack uh, for safety's sake. When you when you hike in the woods, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, it's a very lightweight piece of material that's reflective. Well, I had that with me. I thought, well, I've got the thermal blanket. Maybe I can wrap it up in the thermal blanket, put it against the hillside, and cover it with branches. So I started to do that. I laid the thermal blanket out. And even though I didn't want to, I rolled this creature into this thermal blanket. And as I rolled it up, like a burrito, it was surprisingly light. It weighed only about 50 pounds. Okay. And I rolled it up, and I moved it, and I realized this thing was so light, and I started looking for a place to put it. And I started walking down the trail to find a place to hide this thing. You were moving back toward the direction you had originally come from. Yes, it was time to go home. Sure. And I was approximately one and a half hours from my car. John Lear has been a commercial pilot for 34 years, has been flying for 38 years. He holds the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Award for Outstanding Airmanship, presented in 1968. He has flown missions worldwide for various government agencies. In 1988, John met a government scientist who worked on a back engineering program of recovered extraterrestrial flying saucers for the Department of Naval Intelligence at a secret base within the Nevada test site known only as S-4. 
This uh, scientist not only explained how these craft traveled many times faster than the speed of light, but in March of 1989, took John to a remote desert location. Yes, involuntarily, I might add. <laughs> to watch the Navy test fly one of those extraterrestrial craft. Uh, people talk, John, about this current administration, the Clinton administration, and um, uh, how open they've been, and they have hopes that they will also be open about UFOs and maybe tell us what's going on. What do you think? Never. Uh, when I first got interested in this uh, and realized uh, the uh, overwhelming impact, I got up on my soapbox and uh, did lectures and said, hey, you got to listen to me. There's, there's something going on here that we should all be aware of, and then that was like 1985. And <clears throat> now in uh, September of 1994, I believe that the government was correct to cover it up. And uh, as odd as it may sound, I I, uh, I kind of go along with it. I believe that they, really the public does not have uh, a need to know. Uh, they don't certainly don't have a right to know. The only reason that they would maybe be forced to do it is if, if there was a a crash or a landing that absolutely could possibly not be denied. There have been uh, saucers that have crashed very, very near to cities, and it's been completely covered up. They have teams that, that go out, and uh, it's their business to be sure that the, that the public never finds out. And if this includes relocating personnel or even terminating personnel that have uh, seen this, they go to that extent. Well, I do know this. There have been uh, crashes here near us, John. I'm to the west of you, and you know what I'm near. Yeah. And it's true. The public would never know. They get these areas uh, quickly cordoned off, and uh, you don't get anywhere near it. And, you know, it's wreckage, and it could be anything. And so who knows? If a saucer did come down, they could get control of it uh, very quickly, just like that, couldn't they? Uh, exactly. I heard one of uh, one that, uh, that landed, didn't crash, but landed, just a, maybe a few miles outside of downtown Albuquerque. And these teams are located all over the United States. Uh, they're in underground facilities. They have helicopters. Uh, they have people who are uh, uh, technicians and heavy equipment uh, operators who have passes and authority to go to any civilian or military base and, uh, and drive right off with this heavy equipment. And their job is to go and, and uh, keep this from being seen. And one of the first things they do is they have these portable walls that are put in place. Uh, and then they secure the area. Uh, if it's like near a freeway, what they can do is have a uh, uh, heavy truck purposely have a wreck right there to block the freeway several miles from the uh, crash. How many bodies totally do you think they've recovered? From between uh, 50 to 100, uh, representing at least five different civilizations. Uh, they're all on in cryogenic storage. One of the interesting things here is in 1972, the only civilian that I know that ever got to see the bodies was Jackie Gleason, and he was a very big uh, supporter of Nixon's, and they were out playing golf down there in uh, Miami in 1972. And uh, Jackie Gleason, as not many people know, he had a tremendous interest in flying saucers, and he had one of the, the biggest civilian collections of books and memorabilia and pictures and stuff like that. No, I didn't I didn't know that. Yeah, in a conversation with Nixon, he said, uh, you know, was there any chance of getting to see the bodies? And uh, Nixon said, yeah, sure. They, well, they finished their golf game, they went over and got in the presidential helicopter, and they went to Homestead uh, Air Force Base, and uh, he was shown the bodies. I guess I'm going to begin this show uh, with my experience, so it's out of the way. So here's what happened briefly this last Sunday. I'm going to tell you the story just as it happened. On my way home to a little town to the west of Las Vegas, about 60 miles to the west, uh, called Pahrump, Nevada. And I was about a mile from home. It was uh, about uh, 11... It was between 11 and 11.30. The moon was a bit fuller than it is now, so it was fairly well lit up. Uh, if there was a breeze, it was a very, very light breeze. My wife uh, caught something, I guess, out of the corner of her eye and turned around. 
looked out the back window and said, what in the hell is that? I said, I don't know. And I stopped the car and uh, I turned off uh, uh, the headlights and uh, uh, rolled down my window. And coming up from behind us, just off the driver's side, was something large. I would guesstimate it would be a hundred feet across. Absolutely triangular. And I would guess it to be at about a hundred and fifty feet uh, in altitude. And it was lit. There were two white lights and one strobing red light. The object was moving very slowly. The word I would use to describe its movement was more floating. Uh, certainly it was going um, at, a, at a rate that would not sustain conventional aircraft in flight. There just wouldn't be enough lift at that speed. So it was floating and it literally floated uh, right across the, or very nearly across the top of my car, just a little off to the driver's side. And it was black and solid and triangular. And it moved uh, out and uh, across uh, uh, my area very slowly, floated out across and continued to float in a west-northwesterly direction uh, for, oh, I don't know, uh, maybe as much as four, four, three or four minutes somewhere in there. And then I finally lost sight of it. This was without question a craft. The question is, was it a craft that uh, our military has, that we don't know that they have, or was it from someplace else? I don't know. I would suspect the first before the second, but certainly either one is possible. So that was my experience. I'm 48 years old. I've never seen one of these things before. I didn't think I ever would see one. My wife uh, was witness as well. And I'm still thinking about all this. So there it is. For what it is, for what it's worth, that's my story. And I swear to you, it is true. got a story here it says uh, simply wiretapping rises sharply under Clinton and the fact of the matter is they have about doubled the number of uh, federal wiretaps under the Clinton administration and it is going faster and faster and faster and so uh, I am more than convinced and I, I really can't tell you how uh, that my phone is tapped, Linda Howe's phone is tapped, Dan's phone is tapped. And um, so what? So what? I've got a bunch of different faxes that are about like this. It happened again tonight. A few times earlier this evening, we had two or three of those silent sonic waves pass through the San Diego area. Windows shaking violently. What in the world is the military or is it the aliens up to? Ooh, that's a good question. I've got um, a number of... Well, here's another one. I saw what appeared to be two sets of lights laid out in triangles converging. It appeared like two sets of lights on large jets going in opposite directions. Now, I'm questioning uh, if it wasn't one of those triangular airships that are mentioned on your program. <laughs> well, who knows? But, uh, indeed, there are a lot of shaking... Um, things like that going on uh, in San Diego. Anybody have any idea? Maybe the Aurora out over the ocean somewhere? What is the Aurora? A new aircraft? Can I describe it? No. We just know it's there. On the first time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. Hey, Art. This is Dave calling from uh, Portland, Oregon. This Hello. On 1190 KEX. That's the way to do it, Dave. Hey, uh, yeah, I was wondering if you were familiar with uh, the soft kill technology. Soft kill 
Yeah, it's a new thing that the military is developing. Uh, Wait, by that, do you mean uh, the next generation of laser weapons, that sort of thing? They yes. also have this subsonic thing that they use with sound frequencies. You think they're testing this out on San Diego? Yeah. They're trying to develop how to deliver it in a safe way for the troops to be able to use it. Interesting. Well, I don't know what to say to that. It might be. It's as good a theory as anybody else's. Wildcard line, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, Art. Hi. This is John. Hi, John. San Diego. San Diego, yes. How are you doing? Land of the Sonic Super Killer. Yeah, some, uh, it was kind of a, a roaring sound. Really unusual. Well, a lot of people said they felt it without hearing it. And yeah, you're, yeah, you're, yeah you're, we felt it here, too. And you're saying you, you heard it. Yeah, and I was waiting for a... a a, a sonic boom, but maybe maybe it was somebody from the Clinton administration expressing their their emotions about <laughs> about the election. <laughs> oh, no. You know how do you digest this? How do you digest the fact that so many intelligent, otherwise very normal people would tell these stories? Mass hallucination, doubtful. What is it? Why would so many people tell these stories if there was not something to it? Well, Art, they just want it to be true. Hallucination? Mm, I don't think so. And now back to my international line. You're on the air. Hello. Yeah, hi, Art. Uh, this is John. I'm calling you from Trinidad. The reason I'm calling you, I'm captain of a uh, seismic survey vessel. Uh, we've been doing some uh, seismic work off the east coast of Trinidad. Oh. For the uh, the Trinidad oil monopoly, it's called Petrotrin. This occurred on the 28th of December at about 17.30 local time in Trinidad. Uh, we were doing a transect heading essentially west, going back toward the island of Trinidad, uh, about 30 miles offshore. The water depth was about 120 to 130 meters at that point. Right. We tow an array three and a half miles behind us. There's an array of transponders that send the signal. Those are operated by compressed air, and then there's three that are the receivers. It sends a, a shock wave down, and that is then reflected from the uh, from the subsurface strata back up to the receivers. About a mile forward of that, we tow a thermistor V fin, which takes a continuous reading of salinity, temperature, and depth. And forward of that, we have a side scan sonar, so that you get a contour of the bottom. And the thermistor V fin well, alarm went off, and the thermistor V fin came flipping up to the surface. So the scientists came running up from the computer room. And uh, it was just getting dark. The sun had set and was starting to get dark. It was about the time that the array of transponders passed over the place where the thermistor had come up, uh, the whole sea lit up back there. Wow. You know, like a, like a bright white light shining in the sea. Yes, sir. Almost like you would think a searchlight was shining up out of the sea because you could see it reflected on the clouds. So uh, I looked in the radar, and uh, a target appeared on the radar, which uh, at that time was about four miles behind us, so about a mile behind the array we were towing. And it was a big target. It looked you know, like it, almost the size of a super tanker would show up at that distance on our radar. Yes. And we hauled in the thermistor V fan, and it was mashed. It had hit something really solid. Now, the bottom there is pretty muddy, and the Mr. v fin is kept well off the bottom, so there's really no chance that it hit anything on the bottom. What do you think you encountered? Well, that's uh, a good question. About then, it occurred to somebody to look at the side scan sonar trace. Right. And it showed a large metallic object, and this object was separated from the seabed. It could have been a submarine, okay? Maybe the Thermistor V fin hit a submarine. But it was a lot bigger than any submarine I've ever heard of. 
and uh, I never so, heard of a submarine that had searchlights or lights or anything that, that shone up into the sky like that. So I something guess, very, very large came up out of the sea. And, you know, we turn around and go back, and, and uh, we, we do a sort of zigzag transect all along that area, and we didn't encounter anything like that again. But. We'll call it an unidentified submerged object. I guess so, a, yeah. U, a USO. Captain, thank you. Okay. You take care, my friend. Well, whoa, there's a story for you. And uh, right now, we'll go east of the Rockies. You're on the air. Hello. Mr. Bell. Yes, sir. Do you really think anyone takes you seriously? Um. Takes your callers or guests seriously? I, 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 I don't know. They're all either liars or insane. Well, wouldn't surprise me. As are you. You've been warned. Hmm. Thank you very much. Take care. Jim Keith's book is black, black, black. That's a quote, not of the author, but of Admiral Stansfield Turner, former director of the CIA. Let's get down to it. I mean, case book. There are some cases of the men in black that you obviously believe are the best evidence or might be genuine. One of the most interesting ones happened to a Dr. Hopkins in Maine in 1976. And Hopkins had been doing some uh, UFO research on his own and regressing a, uh, uh, an alleged UFO abductee. When a man showed up at his doorstep, and this was a man in black, this guy was bald. Um, he had very tasty white skin, and apparently he possessed no lips. The lips seem to have been painted on with lipstick, and oddly enough, that's a detail that's repeated in other stories where the, the, face, the facial features are simulated. This uh, man in black um, told the doctor that there was a penny in the doctor's uh, pocket. Uh, he reached in, and, and that's what was there. Um, the man in black uh, instructed the doctor to take the penny in his open hand, and as the doctor looked at the penny, it turned silver, then blue, and then it de dematerialized. Um, and he felt the absence of the weight of the penny on his hand. Um, this uh, man in black asked Hopkins if he had ever heard of a well-known uh, UFO abductee, Barney Hill, who had recently died uh, from a heart attack. And Hopkins said that he had heard of Barney Hill. And uh, the man in black uh, informed Dr. Hopkins that, in fact, this was no heart attack. But the same thing had happened to Barney Hill's heart as had happened to the penny um, in Dr. Hopkins' hand. And that was the last that Hopkins was ever involved in UFO research. He burned all of his tapes, got rid of all of his books. And the only reason we know about this is because his kids were willing to talk Dr. Reed, uh, here you are. You've got the alien finally back to your automobile. I what, right, what? I got him back in my car. Right. I drove home, and looking back in the rear of the mirror, seeing what I had in, in the back end, which reiterated the fact that this was reality. At that point, I got out, took it out of the back of my Jeep, <laughs> took it into the garage, and put it in my freezer. In your freezer? Yes. Okay. Um, Where would you put it? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I guess in a, if you want to preserve something that's dead, you put it in a freezer. I guess that's right. I, I don't mean that sarcastically. It's just, no, no, no. It's a fair question. Okay. Uh, really, where would you put it? I didn't want to bring it in the house. Boy, I'm not sure I'd want to have it sitting in there on top of my TV dinners and pizzas, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. And again, to make to make the long story short, about three and a half days later, I went back out to the freezer, hearing a noise, which I thought might have been rats or the compressor going out. Mm -hmm. I heard what sounded like a scratching sound coming from what I thought was behind the freezer, but then I realized, no, I don't think it's behind the freezer. Yeah. And I thought, okay, well, I'll just open the lid. And all of a sudden, I realized that my 
extraterrestrial was no longer dead or never had been. At this point it was moving and turned its head and moved its arm and I screamed. Oh, it screamed. I slammed the lid and ran to the house. Uh, you actually have that scream on tape, don't you? Uh, yes. Can you play that for us? Yeah, just let me, uh, cue it up. Okay. Um, this is the sound of the freezer basically opening and the creature screaming and slamming the freezer down. Yeah. Oh, I don't know how you lived through that. God. All right. Um, doctor, the body, the alien body. I went underground. On the ninth day, I went back to my house. My house had been ransacked and torn apart. Every single thing in my house had been totally disrupted or destroyed or taken. I went to the garage. I found the door pried loose from the, the actual wall in the garage. I went in, the freezer was gone, there was nothing left. What I have left is what I was able to hide away with myself. And for that very same reason, you are on the move uh, nearly all the time yourself. I went underground and found a new way to survive and to eventually get my life back. And that's why I'm here. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi, Art. Hello. Yeah, I had you um, on my mind today when I said into the president's ear, what do you know about UFOs? And he was in San Diego today. Oh, who, did somebody asked the president that? I did. You did? Yeah. You actually got close enough to ask him that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and so, so what did the president say to you? He turned to his secret service and said, he smiled, he said, UFOs? And that's all. And the Secret Service guy probably made a note, and another guy uh, at a distance focused his uh, telescopic lens and took your photograph. And I made sure that I mentioned your name out loud. That's good. Well, they already know about me, but see, the problem for you is now they know about you. Oh, no. Oh, yes. <laughs> Okay, but, but that's all. I was thinking of you when I asked. This you. means a, it doesn't matter. It means for you, sir, a visitation. that I've ever told my audience this, but my family lineage can actually be traced back to my family having coming, uh, my family came over on the Mayflower. It was one of the original families. Now, having said that, David Icke, I'm going to read David a fax, and then we're going to see where we are here. Uh, the fax comes from British Columbia, comes from Corey. Art, I need you to ask David a question. I met David in Aruba at a summer conference in June. Uh, were you in Aruba in June, uh, David? Mm -hmm. uh, he goes on, I had a chance to ask him if he'd ever heard of Art Bell and uh, why he'd never been on your program. He told me the only reason he'd never been invited on your program was because you, Art Bell, are a 33rd degree Mason and would not want to be exposed on national radio. My question for David is, whether he still believes you are a part of the higher elite Masons. Maybe you have this bloodline. David? Well, um, I have uh, absolutely uh, no evidence that you're a 33rd degree Freemason, so I wouldn't suggest that you're a 33rd degree Freemason. Did you give that answer to this man? Do you recall that? Well, I, 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 don't, I have no evidence that you're a 33rd degree Freemason, so why would I say that? I, I take it you're not a Freemason. Well, I'm frequently asked uh, if I am, and I get so sick of the question. I'm asked if I'm CIA, NSA, and all the rest of it. Uh -huh. I just, I just say sure, and uh, that seems to stop them cold. I have three cats. 
two relatively normal cats and one wild cat. And I love cats. Now, I want to issue a warning at this point that what you're about to hear is going to disturb a lot of people. My guest comes from London, Ontario. Her name is Anne Martin, and she has authored a book called Food Pets Die For. Anne, welcome to the program. Good morning, Art. Good morning. All right. Um, first of all, let me just blankly ask you straight out, is it true or not that our pet food is made up, uh, at least to some degree, of our pets? Yes. It There's is? No, no doubt. No doubt. No doubt. How do you how do you know this to be true, Anne? Back in 1991, a doctor in California had advised me that this was happening. I started then. I was able to trace the euthanized dogs and cats from animal clinics here in London. They were in turn being shipped to rendering plants in Quebec. Whichever plant was paying the highest amount at the time. A rendering plant, for those who don't know, is what? A rendering plant is a facility where all types of garbage go. Uh, dead animals of all kinds, a restaurant, grease and material, supermarket uh, garbage. It's all sent to a rendering plant. Um, these plants, well, put everything in a huge barrel, more or less, where it's cooked at varying temperatures and uh, is turned into, well, what we know as meat meal. Oh, my God. Um, and that includes? That includes the cats and dogs. Cats and dogs are rendered with their fur on, uh, with their tags, if they have flea collars on. What? The plastic bags that they're sent to the rendering plant in from vet clinics and so on, they're rendered. Oh Everything goes in. God. Everything. Why is this not common knowledge? I think the problem has been that it is extremely time-consuming to find out any information from government officials. Uh, well, even our vet clinics here, um, the vets were unaware of what was happening. The fact of the matter is, you told me, the manufacturers of pet food really don't know what the rendering plants are sending them, do they? No, no. The pet food companies don't test as to the sources of protein. They have no idea. Oh, my God. And this is the kind of thing that I'm worried about uh, with regard to our entire society. I think we're losing our collective minds. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Art, you've been messing with stuff. You don't realize the implications. Oh, jeez. Here it comes. I don't want to see nothing bad happen, but if you get too close, you're going to get burned, bud. Uh-oh. Um, yeah. I'm told that. Uh, Art, I wonder if you could give us maybe an update on the uh, Art's Parts. Go up to my webpage. There's a big article up there about Art's Parts. I mean, you won't believe it. It's entitled Talk Show Host Hiding Saucer Parts. So, I mean, you know, in, in a nutshell, without giving you the specifics, which would take all night, I'm not going to do it. Somebody sent me some metal metal fragments that are alleged to have been from the Roswell crash of 1947. We have been trying to determine what the hell they are. The ones sent me were bismuth and magnesium. Bismuth is a very strange element. And magnesium and layered. Nobody can duplicate it. Nobody knows what it is. And we put it through every conceivable test except a few left that we have yet to do. And we have let, uh, contrary to what it says in that, because, you know, why would they write something like that, talk show host, hiding saucer parts? Where would they get something like that? We have been so public with this, intentionally been so public with it. I mean, every result, every 
scientific result that we've received has been publicized up there for everybody to see we've documented carefully every step we've taken and you get a headline like that talk shows hiding saucer parts I'm just going to read the email that I got last night along with what I received this horrendous sound and uh, I warn you uh, this could scare you here's the email dear Art Bell my uncle had told me this story a couple of years ago and I didn't believe him like one of your listeners who discounted the story as nothing more than just a religious newspaper fabricated account the story about the digging of the hole and the hearing of the sounds from hell is very real. It did occur in Siberia. My uncle collected videos and audio tapes and so forth on the paranormal, supernatural. He passed away fairly recently. He let me listen to one of the audio tapes that he had on the sounds from hell in Siberia, and I copied it. He received his copy from a friend who worked at the BBC. Attached is that sound from my uncle's tapes. I was very hesitant to send you this, as the sound bothers me to listen to. I'd suggest that if you do play it on the program, warn listeners in advance so they may have the option of turning the radio off for 30 seconds while it plays. It has always haunted me. To those who discounted the Siberia sounds from hell story, it is true, and I, for one, wish it wasn't. Rick, listening from Chicago. And uh, I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. <laughs> That's it. I'll let you come to your own conclusions, as I usually do. Hi, Art. I have an audio tape message of a ghost. I am a God-fearing woman and do not like pranks, so I assure you this is no prank. If you're interested, I have an email. It gives email address or my home phone. She gives a phone number. I think I'm going to call Sandy right now. Nothing like doing it right here on the air. Let's see if we can get a ring. Hello. Sandy, it's yes, Art. It's... I've heard on the radio. Okay, then you know it's Art Bell, and you know you're on the air, right? Yes, I do. All right, you really have a tape of a ghost? Yes, I do. Tell us a little bit of history about what we're going to hear. Uh, when did you get this? How'd you get it? What happened? This is in Oroville, California. Oroville, California. All right. I'm living in um, Washington now. All right. And uh, my daughter was 11 or 12 at the time, and uh, her and her little friend were in her room, and they had a, one of those real small little radios, you know, you give a kid. Sure. Record tapes. And her and her friend would record, you know, a fantasy story. Well, one day they had recorded a story on the tape, and they went to play it, and there was something else on the tape before their story started. She, you know, excitedly brought it to me, and I played it, and I played it again, and I played it again, and then I got terrified. And I had to listen several times before I really realized what he was saying. All right, all right. Play it. Just play it first uh, without telling us. Okay, here goes. Let's see what we've got here. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. That came across okay? Uh, it came across, uh, yeah. All right, now rewind it. Um, and 
tell me what you think. Now, you've listened many times. We have not. What do you think it says? He says, I wish we were together. Oh. All right, play it again. Okay. And so here it comes again. I wish we were together, huh? Here it goes. Oh, God, that is what it says. <laughs> it really sounds strange. Oh, you know, Sandy. It's got that clicking noise in the back. Oh, Sandy. Do you have any idea of who that is, Sandy? Absolutely not. But we did find out there was a, a murder and a suicide in that house. <laughs> now that is creepy. That is really creepy. Isn't it? it just made it just makes the hair stand up, you know. I'm used to it now, but it used to just make my hair stand up. Well, I'm not. So play it <laughs> one last time. Hit it one last time. I want to listen very carefully. I wish we were together is what it says. <laughs> Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh, Sandy. Bless your heart. Thank you. Uh-huh. David Icke. Give me some examples of uh, control, for example, through the modern media. You start with something you want to introduce. Say you want to give more power to the police, you want to uh, have more power to stop and search, more power to tap phones. You know that if you introduce that policy honestly and say, right, we're going to do this, there would be a mass reaction because people would say, excuse me, that's a fascist state you're trying to introduce here, we're not having this. You know, what about our Bill of Rights? So what you do is you create a problem. It could be a terrorist bomb, it could, like Oklahoma, it could be um, a run on the currency, a government collapse, uh, Y2K, whatever. You create a problem. People then react to that problem and you encourage them through the media to say, this can't go on, something must be done, what are they going to do about it? And at that point, they who have covertly created the problem but got someone else to be blamed for it, glean that reaction, do something, then openly offer the solutions to the problems they have themselves created. Problem, reaction, solution. So, if you want more power to the police, more stop and search, more draconian laws, and you want people not just not to oppose it, but to demand you do it, then you let society break down so there is more crime. Sure, you don't even have to actually suggest it. You just create the situation and the public comes to you demanding that you change it. Exactly. And if we just apply this to um, uh, the UFO situation, now, what I would say is the, quote, aliens aren't coming. They've been here for thousands of years working through these bloodlines and through other means. And when you uh, look at the way that the, the human consciousness is being prepared um, you first of, look, uh, of all look through Hollywood. Hollywood's one of the great homes of uh, mind conditioning. Wherever I go in the world, the Hollywood films are playing, the Hollywood videos are available. Oh, yes. um, all over the world. You look at Independence Day, made by 20th Century Fox, owned by Rupert Murdoch, who is owned by this brotherhood. You look at X-Files, which is made by Fox Television, which is owned by Rupert Murdoch, which is, who is owned by this brotherhood. If you're looking at problem, reaction, solution in regard to this extraterrestrial situation, then look back at um, ways of centralizing power and controlling the population without further recourse to global wars. I got a fax earlier tonight from Chuck Schrammick in Houston, and it says the following, urgent. Strange object sighted near hale -Bopp. Art, I have just taken some amazing pictures of hale -Bopp. They show a Saturn-like object near the comet. We've put it up on my webpage, and I thank Chuck for that. And I'm sitting here look, looking at the photograph right now. It is a gigantic object. Chuck, are you there? I'm here, Art. All right, good. Uh, Chuck, please describe when you took it, what you've got, what you think it might be. Art, I've been taking pictures of, uh, of Hale-Bopp for almost two months now, mm -hmm. and 
Uh, I have a 10-inch telescope with a CCD imaging system. And I was so amazed because I thought, my goodness, I, I wasn't expecting to see a bright star next to it. I have a computer program that can generate the, the field of view that I'll see when I go out there. So I'll, I'll pretty much know ahead of time what I'm going to see. And there were no bright stars predicted to be anywhere around Hale Bob. And Art, I ran inside the house, looked at the one computer, the, the program, the map, the star map, went back outside and looked at the, at the telescope picture on the computer monitor and back and forth and I checked the date and I went, whoa, there's something real that is there. I could see not only was this a round thing, a very bright thing, it had what appeared to be, I call it ring-like things. It, 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 it reminds me of looking at Saturn when the rings are almost on edge. All right, Chuck, so then this, this thing that looks like a ring, almost like a Saturn ring around the object, would not be a, fl a camera flare. No, uh huh. You talk I've seen flares, and, and it's not. It's, that's not it. And this object. Uh, when was the last time you observed Hale Bob? The night before last. And, and the you're night telling that. me, and you're telling me this object wasn't there? No, no. Chuck, that's impossible. I, I know. It seemingly it is, Art. I mean, because uh, that's a big thing there, and celestial mechanics would would dictate that somebody would have had to see that thing move into position there. All right. So I'm not sure. <laughs> of this myself, folks. Uh, let us now go back to uh, Atlanta and Dr. Courtney Brown, Ph.D., president of the Farsight Institute of Scientific Remote Viewing. Doctor, you've contacted a top ten astronomical university, is that correct? One of the best of the best. One of the best of the best. And they confirm this object is there. This professor of astronomy confirmed that the object is there, uh, m and many astronomers have been watching this thing, and that it's quite clear that the thing seems to be moving under artificial control. All right, look, I've got a fax here from somebody in Santa Rosa. This is just typical. I've got zillions of them. This one says, Art, this talk about Hale Bob and ETs scares the poop out of me. Is this real, or is it a modern War of the Worlds broadcast? Michael in Santa Rosa. Okay, Art, this one is real. Look, I've been talking about this for the longest time. I want to say something. This is very important. In the events that are going to be coming in over the next months, my role is the same as all of those here who are at the Farsight Institute. And that is educational, informational, removal of fear by teaching that we will always play a supportive role to the government, to the planet, to the species. We are not out to try to rattle people, but we have been dealing with planetary governments that have been using secrecy for decades now with regard to the ET phenomena, and the ETs are finally pulling the cards saying you just can't continue this realm of secrecy anymore. I've got a map to the burial location of two creatures. We'll decide as the program wears on what it is these creatures are. I'm going to introduce two people to you right now. One is Robert W. Morgan. And you've been researching Bigfoot for how long, Robert? Well, I, my first sighting was 1957, but I didn't start curious research until about 1969. Boggs, are you there? Yes, I am, Art. Good Bug, morning. Bugs, you want to tell us what state you're in? Yeah, I'm in Texas, Art. Texas. All right, Bugs, I've got a, a real expert here, as you can hear, uh, Robert W. Morgan. Uh, Bugs, if you would, begin at the beginning. Uh, and, uh, by the way, Bugs, before we even start, why did you send me this map? Because, Art, my days are limited on this earth, and when I'm gone, my wife's going to call you and say, go for it. Really? And you can reveal to the world a map. I have not been back to that place since that day. All right, let's start then with that day. Go ahead and tell it in as much detail as you want, folks. All right, me and two of my friends, uh, which I'll refer to as Bird Dog and Jim, were cow bobcat hunters. Back in the uh, middle 70s, those varmints were worth a lot of money. Got now the Marines and uh, didn't have much to do in uh, January and February except to kind of sit around. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So about two months, you had prime time hunting. And me and these two guys, we hunted a lot. We were all three from Vietnam veterans and uh, very close, very close friends. One night, we had hunted back in the flatlands, so then we took this road back up uh, north of where I'm at now. And it swung around. I, I, it runs through ranch country. It's probably 25, 30 miles of ranch land. And this had to be four, probably three, four, five in the morning. I don't remember the exact time. Come around the bend, and then it, and it's bottom there, just before you cross the Elm Creek. So you're hunting with lights then? Oh yeah, we're using spotlights off the top, off the roof of the pickup. We're using uh, 500 watt uh, halogen bulbs. And anything with eyes lights up real well. Uh, them eyes, the thing about it is, after you hunted as much as we did, you could tell by looking at a set of eyes what they were. If they were a cow, they were wide apart and they were red. If they were a cow, uh, they were mirror and they were more blue-red. But anyway, we come around this bend and up and over a little hill and dropped into this valley. Well, just as we dropped into this valley, our, our lights hit, picked up a set of eyes. And uh, I hit the brakes. I was driving, and and Bird Dog, he come out on the side. He had a 300 Weatherly Magnum, and he come across the top. I said, what do you got? And he says, I don't know. It ain't something I ever seen before. Well, it just sat there. What color were they, Bugs, if you don't mind? They were uh, furious. Red, the reddest eyes I've ever seen in my life. Really? Under those, under those lights. Uh, we knew it wasn't a deer because uh, of the, the eyes. I pulled my rifle out. I used a 243. I put my scope on it, and I could see whatever it was is crouching. And uh, so, our dog he got out and leaned over the hood of the pickup where he could get him a good shot. And Jim, he come up over the top of the cab, and uh, I said, I don't know what it is, and they don't either. And I said, well, it sure ain't nothing we know about it. Let's take it. And all three of us fired at the same time. And all of a sudden, this thing got up, and it must have been seven, eight foot tall at least. I don't know. Scared the heck out of it. I started running. And well, we all loaded, and we fired again. We knocked it down again. And then it run, I guess, uh, it was probably 100, maybe 150 yards from, from the point we fired the first time till it hit the fence and went into that creek. And uh, we knocked it down. It's probably 25, 30 yards from the, from the fence. It fell into a creek? No, not at this point. And just as it was crossing the creek, we hit it again. Now, uh, was it, excuse me, uh, was it running on four legs or it two? It was running on two legs, just like a human being, you know sure. I mean? It was... Right. right, so it was running on two legs. It's right. something you've never seen before, but you three guys cut down on it. Well, we had done shot, and we did not know what it was. It was hunched over. It, it really wasn't using its front legs, I mean, its, front, its arms, as much as it was... Uh, it wasn't standing up straight. We still thought it was, what I thought it was at first, to be honest with you, was a bear. And that's why we fired. All right, so you, you had uh, three of you fired initially, right? right? And so we you, all fired three times. So now, you... You guys are all non-vets, right? Right. And so you've had night combat, I'm sure. Right. Okay, so you have somewhat, something getting up on two legs and running away and you still cut down on it. But like I said, I originally thought it was a bear. I don't know, I guess we just got a little bit gung-ho and kept shooting. On my Area 51 line, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, Art. Yes. Hi. Um, I, 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 I don't have a whole lot of uh, time. Um, Were you an employee or are you now? I, I, a former employee. Former um, employee. I, I, I was let go on a medical discharge about a week ago. And, and 
I, I've kind of been running a, across the country. Um, oh, man, I don't know where to start. They're, they're, they'll triangulate on this position really, really soon. So um, you can't spend a lot of time on the phone. So give us something quick. Okay. Um, um, okay, what, what we're thinking of as, as aliens are there. Uh, they're, they're extra-dimensional beings that an earlier precursor of the... Um, the space program made contact with. Uh, they they are not what they claim to be. Uh, they have infiltrated a lot of uh, uh, a lot of aspects of, of of the military establishment, particularly the Area 51. Uh, the, the disasters that are coming. They the, the military. I'm sorry. The, the government knows about them and. There's a lot of safe areas in this world that they could begin moving the population to now aren't. But they're not doing, they're not doing anything. They are not. They want the major population centers wiped out so that the, the few that are left will be more easily controllable. Discharge. <laughs> I started getting Well, this was certainly interesting. We are now on a backup system, everybody. A backup system. And uh, you, that one caller that I had on the air. <laughs> I guess we were about in the middle of his transmission, his telephone call, which was a, one of the strangest ones I've ever had, and the entire transmitting system by satellite went down here, and we were notified we were off the air, and it would appear to be from this end, and some sort of uh, massive transmit failure, so we are now using a backup system to be on the air, and not that I would normally believe this kind of thing, mind you, but... I can't help but wonder if somebody, somebody zapped us in some way. Uh, we'll find out. You know, I really do wonder sometimes how long they are going to leave me on the air. <laughs> we just keep pushing the envelope a little farther and a little farther and... It'll be kind of interesting to see when the envelope tears. <laughs> My guest is Jim Keith, and he wrote his book on the men in black. It is creepy. And Jim, I've had um, visits from government agents connected to the work that I do here. In black suits, you know they're carrying, uh, they've got a sort of a a serious, uh, we're here and you don't want to mess with this kind of attitude about them. There is no question about it, Jim, that there is an aura of intimidation that you could cut with a knife. Now, now going over literally hundreds of these, of these men in black encounters, let's say uh, you have seen a UFO, or let's say that you research this material and are getting fairly close to an answer. Okay. Um, a government man walks up to your door in uh, a black suit with a, with a black hat. Maybe he's got weird eyes. Maybe he's got long fingers, as many of these guys do. What it does is it scares the living daylights out of UFO observers. Uh, when you see something like that coming, you're going, oh... Yeah. Uh -oh. <laughs> Especially if they uh, uh, threaten you or threaten your family, and uh, and you're not sure if they're from another planet or not. Um, it's a, I think it's a very effective way to shut UFO witnesses up. You're on the air with Dr. Mack. Where are you calling from, please? I'm calling from KBI in Seattle. Yes, ma'am. Um, Dr. Mack. Has any abductee that you've ever discussed um, abduction with ever told you that a medical doctor has advised them that they, during a skull x-ray or isotope scan, had had laser surgery on their skull? Uh, uh, had a situation where somebody had, a, say, an implant in the nose or a cut in his nose falling in the 
abduction and then it uh, healed up in a couple of days. And then, I had this kind of question asked me in 1976 uh, during the isotope scan, yeah. and I had no skin scar, but I was shown an incision that the doctor claimed was a size of about a half dollar circle on my right skull, yeah. and I told him I've never had any skull surgery. Yes. And, have, you, have, um, you had a, have you had experiences? I've had a lot of experiences. Yeah. I'm afraid I'm an abductee. Yeah. On January the 1st of 1957, he awakened me in my apartment. I had a child dying in Children's Hospital and another child down with the croup, and I was sleeping in the living room. He was six foot eight uh, because he touched the door jam, and he filled the whole apartment with light. So I said to him, I can't go with you now. Can't you see my children are both sick? He just disappeared, and my ex-husband, my former spouse, jumped up and asked me how I turned on and off the lights in the entire apartment. And I said I didn't, and I told him about the man of light. Mm -hmm. He thought I was crazy. What I really want is the truth here. So I'm not going to sit in judgment of... Uh, of bugs. Uh, there are a lot of people responding that way, bugs, as you might imagine. And so I just want the truth, and you are telling us the truth, right? That is correct, Art. I wouldn't have sent you my mouth otherwise. No, I believe you. Uh, there are a lot of people who don't like it, but this is a very important story in view of the pro probable physical evidence that still exists. All right, so you, you had uh, three of you fired initially, right? right? To be honest with you, when it was running, it looked like a bear, and I'm thinking dollar signs. That's why I fired. We went back over there, and we drove up there, and we went down, and we seen blood. We seen some tracks, so we go on up and start following these tracks straight on east from where the creek turned back south. About another 25, 30 yards, there was a uh, plum thicket, and we heard something in that plum thicket. I mean, it was a growl-type sound. And we kind of looked at each other, and so we decided, well, who goes in and see what it was? A growl. Yeah, and again, at this point, we thought, well, it's a bear. So I got elected. I had a 44 Magnum pistol. I climbed into the plum thicket, and I got in, oh, probably 20 feet at the most in art. <laughs> This thing come up at me, I mean, it couldn't have been over, I'd say, six or seven feet from me. I didn't even see it until it was there. And it let out a sound that is just is very similar to the one you have on your tape. And when it did... You're talking about uh, this one, I presume. Anything like that? Yeah, just just the first one, not not a repeat. Just a yeah, repeat. that first not scream a... is uh, said to be uh, an authentic uh, uh, Bigfoot sound, Robert. Yeah, that's what they say. I, uh, first of all, I've never uh, challenged them, uh, so they don't uh, perceive me as a threat of any sort. So they wouldn't uh, try to understand it. All right. So anyway, bugs. It sounded something like that. And I'm I'm basically on my all fours in a crawl position. And I just brought my 44 up, and I started popping shells. The first one hit it. I just aiming right at the chest. And it dropped down. Started back up. I fired again. And it 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 then kind of rocked and went backwards. And it come back up. And I fired again. I hit it three times with a 225 grain 44 Magnum hollow point to probably six to eight feet mm. and it was down well the other guys were standing guard up on top watching they heard me firing and they yelled if I was alright and I said yeah I got it well they came they came crawling in there and so we decided we'd drag it out we got to looking and all this thing had was three holes describe what this thing since you were seeing it now full on what did it look like would you describe this as human looking, as as ape looking? Did it have hair covering it? Uh, what can you tell us about it? It had reddish, brownish red hair. It, its whole body was covered with hair. 
And this was a female. You could tell it had breasts similar to a, to a woman. It had a sexual organ and similar to a woman. Really? Facial, facial features were different than a human being. Like I say, it was covered completely in hair. So we went back in and we found the male probably, I'd say, eight, ten foot behind where she was at. He was dead. He was dead? Yeah. So we drug him out. We laid him out side by side, estimating the male to probably be eight foot plus, female uh, seven plus. We got scared because, like I said, the male, he had sexual organs like a human. Uh, we looked at their teeth. They were not human, human type teeth. I can't say that they were an ape. I can't say that they were a uh, human. If these are humanoids, uh, then under the American Constitution, they have civil rights. And uh, Bugs is indeed correct. He could be charged with uh, manslaughter, at least. I realized what we'd done, and I realized that, you know, there might be consequences. I think that um, what you heard was a significant occurrence. That's my take on it. And if I were a betting man, and I wouldn't, I don't think I would put money on this one way or the other, but if I did, I would bet it was the real thing, and I would bet this man could lead us to those graves. That's what I think. Gary, welcome to the program. Thank you, Art. What's going to happen to the Internet uh, post-Y2K? And that's going to depend very heavily on if the telecommunication industry gets itself compliant. And at the present time, it does not look good. AT&T has about 500 million lines of code to correct. Sprint has about 100 million. This is an enormous undertaking for these companies. There is no compliant public utility in the United States at this time. None? None. Now, the United States government is aware of this and over the last six weeks has begun making plans of implementing a martial law situation wow. uh, in 2000. They're doing it under the guise of the phrase cyber terrorism. They are setting up right now a fusion of the uh, National Guard units and the Army Reserves and they are specifically doing this because they have said we have to have an emergency SWAT team or rapid deployment force to keep peace in the cities. Good Lord. Uh, you really think it, it potentially could be that bad? There will be a shutdown of the banking system. The one thing you can be absolutely sure of is that when the banks say you cannot get your cash out, the response of the public is going to be that I'm not putting any more in. Is this That's real? what I think is going to happen. I think interest rates will go double digit and towards the end of next year, triple digit. My God. I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, Armageddon virtually you're describing. Single seven. Single, are you there? Yes, I am. Um, if you're from the year 2063, then you ought to be able to tell us some of what's coming aside from the horrendous changes in the weather a lot of people want to know what's going to occur around the year 2000 which is just around the bend we've got a big computer problem yes there was a problem with computers but there was actually no problem but there was such a panic it was somewhat like chicken little the sky is falling the sky is falling uh -huh. so many people believed it that they uh, many people made runs on banks. Uh huh. Many people started suicide cults. These type of things. Single. Obviously, I think most people listening right now would agree the weather is definitely, definitely changing rapidly. Yes, and it'll keep changing more rapidly. If these travesty groups are successful, 
how bad is it going to get? Our goal is 15 degrees hotter on average worldwide. And it's going to melt the poles, and we know that in the future. Can you give us a general idea of how they're changing the climate, how they're warming yes. the climate? It's done with EMP pulses. They find tectonic joints or tectonic weak spots, and they pulsate these things. And what they're trying to do is create more volcanism. Believe me, we're having more volcanism right now. Um, it's it it been very seriously on the increase worldwide. Worldwide. Mexico, Sicily, Italy. Um, I, I could go on and on and on these and on. These things are all happening at once. Uh, rumblings under St. Helens to, in Japan. Um, uh, I heard from Stan Dale, a friend of mine in Australia. He's worried about an eruption there. It's worldwide. And, and almost every geologist you talk to would suggest it's ridiculous that there can be no connection between volcanoes. But it's awfully synchronistic uh, that they seem to be all becoming active at once. Yes, that's correct. Things appear to be changing at a very rapid rate. I noticed it. I called it the quickening. It's just a name I came up with. But it's accelerating very quickly. So what's the timeline like? 1 31 is when we want the 15 degrees average. Do you think that the MIM uh, that our government is aware of the existence of the MIM. This has yes, been through a history. This is shown. Yes, they are aware. Wow. Wildcard line, you're on the air. Hi, Mr. Bell. If I needed to uh, get a hold of you for some important information off the air. Uh, how would I be able to do that? Well... We sent many letters to you, and uh, they haven't gotten there. Well, I mean, how do you know they didn't get here? I just know they didn't. You know they didn't? I know it for a fact. <laughs> well, let's not play games. What, what What's it about? Uh... If you go to a break or something, um... No, I, no, I mean, I, look, this is a public program. So, if you got something to say to me, say it here on the air. Well, Mr. Bell, I just know a few things about uh, what some people have been trying to do, and I know damn well that there's been contacts made in Pahrump. For instance, there's a 24-hour gas station out there by you. There's many of them now. Pahrump has grown. The community hospital down there? Yeah, it, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I happen to know some information about that. About what? Well, uh, there's some problems going on down there, Mr. Bell. What kind of problems? Go on, say it on the air. I can't. Why not? Because if I even get caught making this call, I'm in deep trouble. What, somebody's sneaking around asking questions about me? Who who the hell cares? Well... I have nothing to hide. <sighs> so, I mean, this is it. Either you tell me what it is now, or I move on. All right, what? Yeah, I gotta go. Goodbye. First time caller line, merchants of fear. First time caller line, you're on the air. Let me give you a quote from Robert Morningsky, who is a Native American of the Hopi Nation. We are not alone. The astronomers are wrong. The scientists are wrong. They are here. We cannot see them because they hide. They hide in plain sight. We are their servants. We are their slaves. We are their property. We are theirs. Robert Morningsky. Robert, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk to you. Where are you? I have just returned um, from an area called the Canyonlands in Utah, and I don't want to get real specific, but um, while we were there, we discovered some walls with some ancient glyphs attributed to the Anasazi. And one of the most remarkable walls is one that, in fact, 
shows footprints and it tells a story about six toed ancient ones. Hmm. And the implication, obviously, if they have six toes, is if they that they have six uh, fingers yes. on their hand. Yes. These ancient stories told not only in Utah but in Arizona and New Mexico and the glyph uh, says that these very ancient ones, the six-toed people, have been here and have guided man's evolution and his development. Certainly, I think several of your listeners who are familiar with um, some of the ancient cultures, the uh, Babylonian, the Mesopotamian, also realized that the numerical system was a base 12. And certainly, the inference is that if we uh, contemporary human beings use a base 10 based on 10 digits of our hands, then certainly we can infer that the base 12 may very well have come from uh, six-toed, six-fingered beans from the past. Hello, Art. You know me. You know my abilities. I need to caution you because I consider you a friend. I've looked into the archive and I've uncovered a threat. You are in danger. Your family is in danger. Tomorrow must be your last show. There will be no further communication. Bob Lazar is the ex-government scientist who, in 1989, came forward with the fact that he had been part of a team of scientists who back-engineered extraterrestrial disks at a base known as S-4. In the hangar doors, as plain as day, was the craft, a very sleek-looking, uh, very stereotypical flying saucer. I did get to go on the craft, uh, one time, and this was for the express purpose of only seeing the placement of the reactor and how the, the gravity amplifiers worked. Entering the craft was a very ominous feeling. Ominous. Uh, very much so. It was more of a feeling like, um, are you sure we should be here? Uh, <laughs> but and it was no pun intended, it was a very unearthly setting inside. The inside of the craft is essentially all a dull uh, pewter aluminum color, very metallic looking. Mm -hmm. There are no sharp right angles anywhere, and in fact, there were no buttons, lights, switches, or wiring in the entire craft. Really? Really. No levers, no buttons, no, no. lights, no, no switches. What you'll see in the center of the craft uh, is the reactor itself. Uh, surrounding the reactor in the center of the craft are three seats. These seats all face one direction. Uh, this really is an incredible story. Now, uh, briefly, you went to work, obviously, trying to back engineer this. Right. How far did you get? What did you learn? Well, not very. This is where I learned the uh, craft flies with the belly facing the direction you want to go, not as you would normally see the craft in a science fiction movie. Ah. The gravity amplifiers are all brought up to power, and they're focused on a single point. Uh, Bob, how long were you then at S4 doing your work? It was from uh, December of 88 to April of 89. What motivated you to go public? Surely, you had to worry about your life, you had to worry about your career, and I, I don't know whether it's everybody knows, but you were virtually, the modern term is erased. Your educational records uh, were erased. Yeah, for the most part, everything was. Well, what pushed you to go public? What pushed me to go public essentially was fear. Fear of what? Fear of death, fear of prosecution, fear of... For the most part, if I suddenly disappeared off the face of the earth, no one would have known exactly what happened. People disappear all the time.
Listen, I have an announcement uh, that I want to make. You may recall a year ago, I told you that there was an event, um, a threatening, terrible event that occurred to uh, my family, which I could not tell you about. Riders on the storm. Riders on the storm. Into this house we're born. Into this world we're thrown. Like a dog. When the time comes when I can tell you what occurred, I will tell you through the uh, the press. Uh, through the media uh, of one sort or another. I will explain to you the entire thing. It's not that I want to hold anything back from my audience. Uh, however, because of that event and a succession of other events, what you're listening to right now is my final broadcast on the air. This is it, folks. I'm going off the air. And, uh, and, and will not return. What you're listening to is my final broadcast. 